young woman gunned down in Britain's most glamorous department store. There's something about this murder that just seemed so gruesome. A love affair that turned into a nightmare. He said to her, if I can't have you, nobody else will, and that scared her. A stalker who wouldn't take no for an answer. Probably he was immersing himself in some kind of fantasy world. And a murder chillingly foretold in the victim's own words. He said to me, if you dare report me, I'm going to kill you. the Harvey Nichols store in London's Knightsbridge. Just before closing time on Tuesday the 13th of September 2005, customers and staff witnessed a scene they would never forget. I heard gunshots and just dived for cover. It was horrific. It all happened so quickly, and the next thing I see is the gun. The gunshots were all fired in quick succession. I thought people had taken over the store. It was really scary. We were all terrified. The scene that we were told about was one of absolute pandemonium. Obviously, uh, there was a great degree of panic among the people who witnessed their shoppers and indeed staff at the Harvey Nichols store. Two people were shot dead at the exclusive Harvey Nichols department store in London tonight. Police said a man and a woman were pronounced dead at the store. Detectives aren't looking for anyone else in connection with the shooting. As a journalist, I've covered a number of quite horrific murders, but there's something about this murder that just seemed so gruesome, the sense that uh, in a public place, Harvey Nichols being one of the most uh, exclusive stores in the area, that somebody was able to walk in, carry out a shooting. The thing we established was that four shots were fired, and then a further one was shot into the ceiling, and then he turned the gun on himself. Behind this shocking murder in the most prestigious shopping street in the UK lies a tale of love, obsession and a very modern phenomenon, stalking. Now, one of the fastest growing crimes in Britain, it's estimated a fifth of all women will be followed and harassed at some point in their lives. And what can you do to protect a woman when the person targeting her is persistent and threatening? Is the law strong enough to protect her? And can even the tightest security measures keep a woman safe? against a determined and violent stalker. I have to see Claire. I love you, and I know that you love me too. She said she loved me, and she liked me the same way I liked her. Claire Bernal was 22. She lived with her family in Tunbridge Wells until a dream job opportunity led her to London. Claire showed a, a great interest in makeup when she was about seven. Then, by the time she was 12, she was making her face up beautifully and she was always on for making up my face or, or her friend's face. And then she went to Shepperton Studios and she trained um, as a theatre makeup artist. And then this job came up for La Prairie. La Prairie is an exclusive range of cosmetics and skincare goods with products retailing up to £1,400. Claire wrote to the company applying for a job at one of their concessions in London department stores. She was desperate to work it in one of the big department stores and I went with her on the day of her interview to London 
And I remember her being so nervous about it. And I remember that she, she had a portfolio with her and she just kept going over it and over it and over it to make sure that she had it absolutely perfect. Claire's application was successful. In the autumn of 2003, she began working in the beauty department of Harvey Nichols. Claire was very proud to be working in Harvey Nichols. Yeah, it, it's obviously, it's a very beautiful store. Harvey Nichols is the extreme form of the upscale department store. It's extreme because it's devoted to beauty and women. The people who go there are rich or aspirant women who are on a mission. They're going to make themselves feel better and to enter a different world. For a girl like Claire, going to Harvey Nichols will have been making it. Claire was fantastic at her job, I think, mainly because she was so genuinely warm and, and friendly. She was so easy to get along with and, and to talk with. Um, yeah, she was just a lovely, lovely person. Claire was completely unaware of her own beauty. She didn't see it. Her beauty would come from inside as well, and people would see it. After a year working at the store, Claire met the man who was to become her killer. 30-year-old Michael Pesh had also recently started work there as a security guard. There's not a great deal known about Michael Pesh, apart from the fact he came from Slovakia. Um, it's thought that he may have had a relationship, be it married or otherwise, whilst he was living there. He had some form of military training whilst in Slovakia and obviously was a candidate for the security industry when he came to the UK. Pesh had come to the UK in 2003 on a student visa, but Slovakia's entry to the EU the following year meant he could stay indefinitely. Pesh was a graduate of a military-based high school and had served six years in the Slovakian army. In 2004, he swapped one uniform for another, getting his security guard's job at Harvey Nichols. Claire phoned me up one day and said she started seeing this man. She said he was older than her and that he seemed quite shy and was very attentive. But they only actually went out together for three weeks, so it was, it was quite... Uh, a short period of time before he started to show signs of being very possessive. There were signs of jealousy too. Pesh complained about Claire spending time with her friends rather than him. She saw this particular mate almost as a big sister and um, he insinuated that she was maybe had sort of lesbian tendencies. Claire didn't know it, but Pesh was already displaying the classic behaviour of a potential obsessive. That kind of level of control, manipulation and jealousy within a relationship uh, could quite easily progress at the breakdown to stalking behaviours and it would be clearly one of the warning signs. 1.2 million people are stalked every year in Britain, more than half of them by ex-partners in the majority of these cases, there are signs of possessive or abusive behaviour during the relationship. She was already starting to feel a bit uncomfortable about him. He was also talking about a future together. He was, he was telling her he loved her and did she love him. And she said, what am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> she just didn't know. She just didn't know how she felt about him. He was just, just that it was all happening much, much too fast. After dating Michael Pesh for just a matter of weeks, Claire grew tired of his behaviour and ended the relationship. It wasn't until many weeks later that she documented the terrifying series of events that followed. She made statements to management at Harvey Nichols and to police. This is what happened in her own words. Pretty soon into the relationship, I realised Michael seemed to be quite possessive and because of that and the fact that I didn't feel we were going anywhere, I ended our time together on 28th of February 2005. 
On that day, Michael became upset that our relationship had ended. I told him to get the train, as all this occurred at the station. He didn't get on the train, and instead followed me to my home address, and he sat outside the address for a period of roughly two hours. During this time, he kept calling me. I received roughly 20 missed calls, and he came to the door and spoke to one of my flatmates, and was being very rude and shouting at her, and kept saying he wanted to talk to me. She said that I didn't want to talk to him. After two hours, Pesh finally gave up and went away, but this was only the start of Claire's ordeal. The following day, he followed her home with a, a big bouquet of flowers, and she said, just leave me alone, Michael. It's just not working out. And she left those, the, those flowers outside her, her door, and they stayed there all week. She, she wanted him to get the message, but again, on that second day, he, he sat outside for, for, for a while. He just wouldn't go. Pesh's behavior became increasingly sinister, and one threat would cause Claire to fear for her life. If you dare to court me, I'm gonna kill you, remember that. When beauty consultant Claire Bernal ended a brief relationship with Michael Pesh, a security guard who worked with her at Harvey Nichols, he refused to accept it was over. At the time, Claire didn't realize how serious his harassment would become, and it wasn't until much later that she reported him. When she did finally make her statement, she painted a disturbing picture of a man becoming more and more obsessed. I've become increasingly worried and frightened by Michael's behavior towards me, both at work and outside of work. At work, Michael has constantly approached my counter whilst both on duty and pestered me to rekindle the relationship. People often get very upset when relationships break up and it's not uncommon for people to, uh, to plead uh, for their partner to take them back. Uh, most people don't continue that behaviour for more than a week or two. Some people uh, continue it uh, after that period, often for many months, uh, and those are the people that we would call stalkers. I've often seen him nearby, just staring at me, and on some occasions I feel like he's using nearby mirrors to observe me. She felt that he was there the whole time. He was watching her. He would stand in line to her counter, and he'd just stare at her. He'd, he'd stare at her from the moment she came on duty to the time she left. It's very difficult to speculate what goes through the mind of an individual who's engaged in stalking behavior. But we do have the idea that often these are calculated behaviors which are designed to control that person uh, and to actually manipulate that person. Another time, after the 28th of February, I was leaving work when Michael approached me in full security uniform and stopped me by placing his hands on my shoulders from behind. I love you, and I know that you love me too. I said, no, I don't. Yes, you do, you stupid little girl. He shouted this out in the middle of the Harvey Nichols Street, and she was very embarrassed. Uh, and it, it, it had got to the point where she, she just didn't know what to do. I informed him to leave me alone, and I told him this on numerous occasions. However, he took no notice. When someone is rejected by a partner and responds by stalking them, they gain reward from any contact, even if the person is uh, telling them uh, negative things, such as that they don't want to see them again. It's very important in such circumstances uh, to avoid any form of contact with the stalker because this encourages them. Uh, what in effect happens is that the stalking contacts become a substitute uh, for the previous relationship. A poem Pesh wrote in his diary around this time gives a further insight into the mind of a stalker. From our love, all that is left is a dried up spring. Yet all we had to do was push away the stone that was blocking it. I have as many memories of you 
as there are in a forest trees. You're my only love, so ring me, please. Petch wrote poetry, or at least, you know, looked at poetry and, and kept poetry. It may be that he was kind of romantically inclined and, and was seeking some kind of solace in, in poets' writings, but probably he was immersing himself in some kind of fantasy world. I have also received many text messages since we broke up, most of them from Michael professing his love for me and asking for forgiveness. Some around Easter were particularly disturbing in that they were written in the context of us still being together. The text messages continued, the phone calls continued, up to 40, 50 times a day. And Claire was at the end of a tether. A statement Claire later gave to a police officer reveals the effect the stalking was having on her. This all caused me to be distracted at work. This is affecting my sleeping pattern in that I haven't slept as I'm scared that he's waiting outside. Stalking is always very destructive to the life uh, of the victim. People can come to live in fear. Uh, they may have to alter their behaviours, uh, alter their work patterns uh, because of the stalking. And this can cause anxiety, uh, depression, uh, even post-traumatic stress disorder. I've also had to change my phone number due to the amount of calls and texts he had sent. The harassment lasted for about five weeks. Instead of it slowing down, it accelerated. And Claire then started to feel frightened. He said to her, um, if I can't have you, nobody else will. And that, that scared her. Um, and we just, neither Claire and I knew what to do about the situation. When he threatened, um, you know, if I can't have you, no one else will, this is the classic phrase, if you like, uh, that usually raises alarm bells, in, you know, when we're looking at stalkers, um, because it, it is that phrase and that encapsulates the danger element of stalking. In other words, it's a possessive thing. This is not romantic love, this is not caring for a person. This is total control, meaning, you know, if, if I I can't have my way and own you, I will make sure no one else does, by whatever means. That is ultimately the essence of what stalking behaviour is and should always be taken very seriously. Claire still didn't realise the full extent of the danger she was in. Two women a week are killed by a current or former partner. Pesh's behaviour took an even more sinister turn when on the 26th of March, he followed Claire home on the tube. I need to talk to you before I do something stupid. I tried to ignore everything he was saying and doing as we were getting out of the tube at London Bridge. I said to him, you just leave me alone. I want nothing more to do with you. As I was running away from the platform, Michael ran up behind me and pushed very hard, using just one hand. Claire changed onto another train, but Pesh continued to follow her. She warned him she would call the police if he didn't leave her alone. If you dare to me, I'm going to kill you. Remember that. I then said to him, if you leave now, I won't report you. He then started to be nice by trying to touch my face and kiss me, but I pushed him away. He then started to apologise, then got off the train, and due to the train not having left the platform, he began banging on the window and waving at me. Claire phoned me up and she was crying down the phone. And she said, Mum, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know whether to report him or not. And I didn't know what to do because he made it very clear, you will report me and I'll kill you. He was a military man, ex-military man. He knew how to use a gun. And uh, we just didn't want to antagonise him. If you dare report me, I'm going to kill you, remember that. 
when he said that um, he would kill Claire if she reported him, um, this is a clear s sign that it's escalating. Um, this is not something that you would casually say to someone. To actually state that you were going to kill them means that the germ of the idea is definitely in your mind and you want it to be in the other person's mind. It has escalated. This is a very serious situation. It was at this point that Claire went to Harvey Nichols' management and made her statements chronicling the events of the previous weeks. In response, they put Pesh under observation and could clearly see him harassing Claire on their CCTV cameras. As a result, the company suspended Pesh from duty and banned him from entering the store or contacting any staff members. Meanwhile, Claire took her complaints about his behaviour to the Metropolitan Police. A police investigation will look at the complete scenario, the wishes of the victim, what's been said, what's been done, what the likely outcome's going to be, and they'll consider a number of charges. Stalking, certainly. Threats to kill, perhaps. They'll look at the case as a totality and bring, in consultation with the Crown Prosecution Service, the right charges. Claire's case was investigated by a young WPC based at Southwark's hate crime unit. In a statement to her, Claire revealed the efforts she was making to escape Pesh's stalking. Efforts that were unsuccessful. Myself and my flatmate moved to a new address a week earlier based on Michael's behaviour and him harassing me. And on this day, I saw Michael walking away from the direction of our new address. Moving address is unlikely to work, uh, as is changing a telephone number. Uh, stalkers tend to be very determined and often quite resourceful in this respect. And it's quite possible to track down somebody's change of address or change of telephone number within hours. On the 6th of April, Pesh was formally suspended by Harvey Nichols at a disciplinary hearing. Police then arrested him at the store and took him in for questioning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the tape, please? Michael Pesh, 12th July 1975. And your solicitors are? My name is Stephen Fiddler and I'm from Stephen Fiddler & Co. I first met Michael Petch when I was called in as a duty solicitor. When I arrived at the police station, I asked, as I would always do in this sort of offence, whether there were any psychiatric problems and whether there was a need for an appropriate adult. And I spoke to the doctor and I asked him about it. And he was very open, very helpful. He said that he'd examined him fully. Um, there were no psychiatric problems and that he just put it down to love. Um, and obsessional love behaviour. Do you want to tell me everything that's happened? Pesh was well enough to be interviewed. There were no obvious signs at this stage of what he might go on to do. His account of his relationship with Claire was to vary wildly from hers. What's been going on? I have to say, in the beginning, I ended. I ended the relationship. You ended the relationship? I didn't say, like, it's over but I, I made her feel like it was over. OK, what happened? She was confused. It's just that she said that she loved me and she liked me the same way I liked her. It was just too strong for, for her as a young girl. The next day I realised I did not want to lose her. There are two things that I think were striking from his interview. He initially indicated to the police that he felt that he had ended the relationship with Claire Burnell. And then he regretted it, he said to the police, that he had ended it. And then he went back to her and couldn't understand why she was not going to continue. He did say in the interview that he was sorry if he ha had upset her. She then said that you said to her, if you dare report me, I'm gonna kill you. Do you remember saying that? No, what for? You tell me. I never say anything like that. He admitted to what he was doing, bar one particular point, and that was the incident at London Bridge. If you dare report me, I'm going to kill you. Remember that. He admitted the other uh, incidents, but said that he wanted to see whether she still wanted to carry on with the relationship. Other than Claire's word, the officers had no other evidence that Pesh had made threats to kill. 
Although he had now been brought to the police's attention, it was a threat he was still determined to carry out. After Michael Pesha's first police interview, the Crown Prosecution Service advised that he be allowed out on bail until further statements could be gathered. Pesh was free, on condition that he stayed away from the Harvey Nichols department store and the beauty consultant he'd been stalking for over five weeks, 22-year-old Claire Bernal. Once bail conditions were set, we felt that the situation was being dealt with and both Claire and I breathed a sigh of relief and we really did think that the problem was over. But he wasn't scared of the police. He had no fear. The bail conditions failed to deter Pesh from going near Claire. Just four days after they were set, he appeared again outside her home. I promise I was not following you. I felt really scared and shocked. I could not understand why he was there. Claire called the police, who immediately arrested Pesh for breaking his bail conditions. The fact that Pesh broke his bail conditions is possibly very indicative of the fact he was not taking the law seriously. Mr Pesh, you were charged with the harassment of Claire Bernal under Section 2 of the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. How do you plead? Not guilty. When Pesh appeared in court the next morning, his solicitor once again requested bail. I request bail on the basis that the bail conditions imposed are adequate to overcome the Crown's objection that Mr Pesh may commit further offences or interfere with prosecution witnesses. The request was denied. I'm refusing you bail on the grounds that you may re-offend or interfere with prosecution witnesses. You're remanded in custody for a period of seven days. Bail conditions are important. They protect the victim from further offences being committed against them. And any one breach of that is a serious matter which can result in arrest and imprisonment. And in fact, that's what happened at Pesh. Pesh was remanded in Belmarsh Prison and the trial date was set for the 31st of August. We just knew that he was arrested on the 10th and that Claire never saw him again, so... Uh, we all relaxed because he broke those bail bail conditions and he was never seen again then we felt that the system was working but did the system work or did it fail just a week after michael pesh was remanded in custody in belmarsh prison he was let out a full 4 months before he was due to stand trial for harassing claire and in that four months came a series of events that was to end in her death. At the centre of those events was Pesh, a man who had been given freedom to move around in public, even though he'd previously broken his bail conditions. If a stalker once breaks an injunction or a bail condition, uh, that is fairly ominous, and they cannot be trusted to adhere to such conditions or restrictions in the future. Pesh wasn't only free to move around Britain, he was free to travel back to his home country, Slovakia. And when he did arrive back in Eastern Europe, he began planning Claire's murder. It appears that Pesh went to Slovakia. No one knows exactly when he travelled, but it seems um, logical to suggest that it was probably sometime in May, uh, because we know that he made his first step to obtain the firearm on the 8th of June. In Slovakia, the process for applying for firearm permit starts off with the application to the police, which includes a background check, uh, which in this instance didn't show any uh, criminal conviction. Uh, it also has to be accompanied by a letter from the GP of the applicant say that they're of sound mind. The second stage then consists of an exam. Pesh cleared the background checks and on the 14th of June 2005, he passed the firearms exam. A month later, he received a gun licence and bought a pistol, which he registered with the Slovakian police. 
This pistol was a CZ-75 semi-automatic pistol made in the Czech Republic. Uh, very, very popular all over Europe. This particular model was compact, so it was slightly smaller than the full-size version and ideal for carrying in a concealed manner. In August, just days before he was due to stand trial for harassing Claire, Hesch was able to travel back into Britain carrying the gun. Hesch went to Slovakia and got a gun and brought it into this country on a vehicle ferry. Now, the practicalities are not every vehicle and not every person is going to be searched when they come into this country. Of course, it's against the law, but the realities are not everyone's going to be searched, and he got back with a gun. It was certainly astonishing that somebody who um, had made threats to kill was, was able to obtain that weapon and then was able to leave the country and come back into the UK with it. On the 31st of August 2005, Pesh appeared at Tower Bridge Magistrates Court to stand trial for harassing Claire. Mr Pesh, you were charged with the harassment of Claire Bernal under Section 2 of the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. How do you plead? Guilty. When I met Mr Pesh at court, he initially did not want to change his plea to that of guilty. I explained to him at length the strength of the evidence, um, that there was no motivation at all for any of the witnesses to make up anything against him. And that it was my view that the case was very strong against him. And after hearing my view, he then decided that he would plead guilty. And that was the first time, I think you could say, he really, from my point of view, accepted that he had done something wrong. At this time, the case is adjourned for pre-sentencing reports. Mr. Pesh, you are ordered to reappear on September the 21st. All options remain open to the court. She phoned me that afternoon and she sounded elated and she said, Mum, now finally I can put, put the whole unpleasant episode to bed. Uh, she said he'll get a minimal sentence, so there's no reason at all why he should, he should be angry towards me. But the ordeal was far from over. Despite previously breaching his bail conditions and despite admitting harassment, Pesh was granted bail once again. No one could have predicted he was planning murder, but Claire's mother now believes there were warning signs. I found out from Harvey Nichols that they were so concerned about Claire's safety that, that they had put together a file of uh, comments from people who knew Claire and knew Pesh and that he'd actually asked a part-time uh, member of staff who was uh, a trainee lawyer uh, what the maximum sentence for murder was. The fact that Pesh covertly asked someone what possibly the sentence might be for murder is absolutely terrifyingly a high-risk warning sign. It is a beacon saying that this person must be serious contemplating, you know, what will happen to me if I do this. On September the 13th, 2005, less than two weeks after pleading guilty to harassing Claire, Michael Pesh walked into Harvey Nichols. He was high on cocaine and armed with the semi-automatic gun he'd bought in Slovakia. He went behind the counter where uh, Claire was standing and approached her from behind and discharged one shot into the back of her head. Uh, she, she obviously collapsed. Um, he then discharged um, three shots into her face, um, perhaps to deliberately disfigure her. He then uh, discharged a further uh, shot into the, into the ceiling, and then he killed himself. The murder itself uh, was carried out with almost military precision. He knew where Claire worked, because obviously he'd worked there himself and knew where her store was. It was utterly ruthless. It was, it was incredibly aggressive, and I think it was deeply shocking for everybody who heard about it. As soon as... They told me what had happened. I knew it was Pesh. I just knew. I said, it's Pesh. And I went into a state of shock. The inquest into Claire's death opened in November 2005. 
Claire's mother insisted it should be extended to see if the authorities had overlooked vital evidence about the state of mind of her daughter's killer. Why should Claire just be blown away, just like that? I felt as if I, I had to carry on Claire's battle. I had to, I'd be letting Claire down by not getting to the bottom of you know, what, everything. The inquest focused on a variety of different aspects. Firstly, how did Pesh bring the gun into the country? Should the customs and excise have prevented that from happening? Could the police have done more to protect Claire? It emerged that the police officer in charge of Claire's case had a high workload and had received limited training in how to deal with domestic violence. The inquest was a very emotional hearing. At one point, the young female police officer who handled the case told how she discovered uh, that Claire had been murdered. And at one point, the, the hearing was halted whilst uh, she was comforted. She broke down in tears. It was very evident that uh, that female police officer had worked very hard to try to protect Claire. You cannot have a system whereby you have a police officer who has one day's training in domestic violence with over 20 to 25 cases to, to deal with and think that, that um, Claire was, Claire was adequately, adequately protected. Of course she wasn't. Of course she wasn't. What they did find out was that um, a, a 124D form was not filled in by the, inve the initial investigating officer. That form helps officers establish the threat that um, a, a man poses to someone if he is thought to be a stalker or, 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 or involved in a hate crime. However, the inquest did establish that even if that form had been filled in, because Pesh had no previous convictions, that he was in all probability a low risk, and that is the way he was assessed. The coroner concluded that the police weren't to blame and that, even if the form had been filled in, Michael Pesh would have probably still carried out his plan to kill Claire. He ruled that Claire was unlawfully killed and that her death could not have been anticipated. The term stalking conjures up many perceptions. Unfortunately, not all of them correct. Since Claire's death, the police have increased specialist stalking training and are now examining the way they assess danger to stalking victims. Clearly, what we have seen is some examples, including that of Claire Bernal, where there's been some tragedies that, on reflection, the police service has had to ask some serious questions. Did we get it right? The difficulty we've had with stalking and harassment, and I think some of the high-profile cases that we've seen in recent years, has shown us that, on occasion, we've been trying to apply the similar sort of questions, a similar sort of risk assessment uh, that we've been using in domestic abuse, and often it just doesn't apply. The Association of Chief Police Officers are now working on ways to identify the specific dangers posed by stalkers to people like Claire. We've employed leading psychologists to work with ACPO and work with the police service to try and ensure that we can ask a series of questions that will help us identify at a very early stage whether someone is at a, a heightened state of risk or a lower state of risk and therefore we're confident in the future we can ask those questions and be able to identify them. Michael Pesh, 12th July 1975. At least one leading psychiatrist says if Pesh had been subject to such specialist assessments, Claire's death may have been avoided. There were various characteristics in uh, the Claire Bernal case uh, which would, had they been assessed, uh, have given rise to a particular concern. Firstly, this man was persistent. 50% of harassment cases stopped within two weeks. Uh, his did not. Uh, secondly, he was working in the same place as Miss Bernal uh, in the literature. This is an important risk factor. Thirdly, he was making threats to kill her. Uh, and fourthly, an important fact about him is that he had military service and uh, was familiar with firearms. In terms of the risk assessments that are made by stalking clinics and stalking experts, uh, this would have flagged up uh, this particular case as one worthy of particular attention. The case of Claire Bernal hit the headlines because it happened here at a world-famous department store. 
but the reality is that every week two women are killed by a current or former partner. And it's estimated that a fifth of all women will be stalked at some stage during their lifetime. It is these figures which have driven Claire's mother to take matters into her own hands. I was very shocked at, at hearing the statistics. Since Claire, I've learned about another world that we live in, and I've, I've been cocooned, and I've cocooned my, my children, uh, wrapped them in cotton wool, and um, it's my deepest regret that I, I trusted um, the, 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 the system to, to look after Claire. You have to find. Yeah, you've got yeah. to find. Tricia has now become close friends with Carol and Stella, whose daughters were both also stalked, then killed by ex-boyfriends. The three have now set up a fund to raise awareness of the dangers of stalking. The reason that we're all doing this is that we truly believe we can save lives. We all feel that we are carrying on our daughter's battle and nothing will stop us doing that. That's, that's the thing that matters now. The three mothers are supporting a pioneering project in Croydon, South London, called the Family Justice Centre. It's the first of its kind in Europe, and here they recognise that to prevent murders like Claire's, more work needs to be done. I cry two, three hours a day. All victims of stalking or domestic violence are classed as high risk when they first arrive. Then the danger they are in is fully assessed. If people were coming here and they were coming here for help with stalking, we'd um, listen to what they would say was happening, um, what help they needed, and then put them in touch with the right people here. Family Justice Centre, I help you. At the moment, we've got 30-plus agencies and organisations, and that's people from Relate, from Victim Support, from Croydon Women's Aid, who provide refuge, um, police officers, uh, investigators. So right across the full range um, of services that people would need to get help from. Are you still part of the same team? Yeah. Police in Croydon believe working with other agencies at the centre makes it easier for them to protect victims of stalking. In the year before the Family Justice Centre was established in Croydon, we had four murders that were related to domestic violence. The centre's now been in operation for two years, and we haven't had domestic-related murders. But the centre is far more than that. Whilst we want to prevent murders, we want to reduce harm. It's providing the environment. It's meeting the needs of the persons. From a police service perspective, the Family Justice Centre enables the police officers to focus their skills on the investigation. It's about holding perpetrators to account. We're out to support Family Justice Centres, and the three of us truly believe that they save lives, that they could have saved our daughters' lives. Tricia, Stella and Carol want to see one such centre in every city. They were there in January 2008 when the Home Affairs Select Committee visited. The MP's mission to find out if they're the answer to the growing problem of stalking and domestic violence. If we had this kind of setup and Claire was able to go to it, do you think that the scenario that ended up with her dying would have been different? I think it quite possibly could have been different because you're not having one person having to assess. You have many people assessing. Um, pulling together their expertise. What I'm trying to campaign for is police and other agencies to pull together and work together. And by doing so, you'll get a true and accurate assessment. Nobody can get into the mind of a, a, the perpetrator and he, he may well have found a way but it's, it's all those little pieces that everybody knew, and I didn't find out till afterwards, taking a piece here and taking a piece there. And the, eight, what, what the Family Justice Centre would have pulled all those pieces together, everybody's information they would have pulled together, and then they would have had a much, much stronger picture of what that man was capable of. 
Claire's murder brought shock and fear to the plush surroundings of Knightsbridge. But almost three years on, the police and authorities' new approach to stalking may yet save other lives. For Claire, of course, any improved protection for stalking victims is too late, both for her and for her family. I informed him to leave me alone, and I told him effect in my sleep pattern and that I haven't slept as I'm scared that he's waiting outside. Day, and he said to me, if you dare report me, I'm going to kill you. There's a big gaping hole in our lives. This terrible void that will never be filled. It's preventing other families from the heartache that we've, we've felt and, and, our, and our feeling. And doing something positive, something that for Claire.